Okay, so now we're going to talk about standard five. And I can't say that this is the most important standard, uh, because if we had to say that there's uh, a first among equals among the standards, that would be standard one, where the program defines its mission, because that sets the framework for evaluating the program's performance on all of the other standards. But standard five is the place where, as a site visitor, you're probably going to have to give most of your time and attention because it's at the core of the shift to competency-based accreditation. It's also the standard that's probably creating the most anxiety for programs and the most uncertainty in how to report what they do and their concern about whether what they're doing is, is sufficient. And at least during the transition period, which we'll talk about a little bit later in this particular session, only a very small amount of information is actually provided to COPRA in the self-study report. And it's up to the site visit team to document the program's progress on the full range of component parts of Standard 5. So Standard 5, though, is one of three standards, along with Standards 3 and 4, that is about matching operations with the mission. And in this case, the particular operations that we're interested in are student learning, or what we sometimes refer to as competencies. The entire Standard 5 is divided into four sections, dealing with universal required competencies, mission-specific required competencies, mission-specific elective competencies, and professional competencies. That sounds like a mouthful, but hopefully after this session you'll feel very comfortable with what each of those means. So let's start at the beginning with the universal required competencies. The language of Standard 5.1 is that as the basis for its curriculum, the program will adopt a set of required competencies related to its mission and public service values. The required competencies will include five domains. I'm going to talk about those five domains in just a minute, but let's pick apart this section of the language of the standard. The idea here is that NASPA is not prescribing specific competencies that each program has to um, instill in its students and assess in its students, but rather that within a general framework of these universal required competencies in these five domains, each program has to define the specific knowledge, skills, and abilities that their graduates will have that are relevant to their own mission and their own public service values. So you'll remember that in Standard 1, each program had to articulate its unique mission and how that is linked to the public service values that that program has chosen to emphasize. So as it goes on and defines competencies in each of these areas, the expectation is that it does so in in light of its particular mission and the public service values that it already articulated in Standard 1. So those five domains are as follows. To lead and manage in public governance, to participate in and contribute to the policy process, to analyze, synthesize, think critically, solve problems and make decisions, to articulate and apply a public service perspective, and finally, to communicate and interact productively with a diverse and changing workforce and citizenry. And again, in each of these five areas, the program cannot simply restate that we require our students to be competent in leading and managing in public governance, for example, but they need to define in light of their own mission, let's say it is to prepare people for um, city manager positions. It's a program that emphasizes local government and primarily serves in-service students who are advancing to the level of city management. Then they would define the knowledge and skills and abilities related to leading and managing and public governance in terms that are specific to high-level decision making at the local government level. Similarly, in terms of analyzing, synthesizing, thinking critically, solving problems, and make deci making decisions. A program that is primarily a public management program, maybe preparing people for nonprofit positions, 
will define that in ways that are perhaps quite different than a program that is more of a public policy program and preparing people to be analysts. And so the kinds of analysis and the kinds of problem solving and decision making skills that are expected or competencies that are expected will differ depending on the program's mission. That's standard 5.1 and every program that is seeking NASPA accreditation is expected to develop in its students competencies in each of these five areas. And they need to define those competencies relevant to their own mission in each of these five domain areas. The next two standards, standards 5.2 and 5.3, may or may not apply to a program depending on the nature of that program. Standard 5.2 has to do with mission-specific required competencies. Here it says that the program will identify core or required competencies in other domains that are necessary and appropriate to implement its mission. So if a program, by virtue of its mission, has additional competencies that it thinks every student completing that degree needs to have, and it can't find a way to place that in one of those five domain areas, then it should articulate an additional competency under Standard 5.2. Not every program will have something under 5.2. Some programs may find that all of the competencies they have related to their mission fit within the five domain areas of Standard 5.1, and they don't need to have anything under 5.2. But if a program has a specific mission and they don't find a place for a particular competency within one of those five domain areas, then this is the place where they should articulate that additional competency. Standard 5.3 is what's labeled mission-specific elective competencies. And here the standard says the program will define its objectives and competencies for optional concentrations and specialization. So if a program has no concentrations and no specializations available to its students, then obviously it doesn't have to deal with this standard at all. But if a program advertises and makes available to its students a track, a concentration, a specialization, whatever language they use, that is going to provide to students some additional knowledge and skills, and presumably that's the whole purpose of having an elective or a concentration or a specialization, then it needs to define what's the purpose of that concentration, what's the purpose of that track, what's the purpose of that specialization, and related to that, what additional or different competencies will students have if they complete that specialization or that track. So not all programs have tracks or concentrations or specializations, but those that do need to identify a particular competency or a set of competencies uh, for each of those concentration or specialization areas. Then finally, standard 5.4, a little bit different but also relevant here, is what was referred to as professional competencies. And here the standards say that the program will ensure that students learn to apply their education through experiential exercises and interactions with practitioners across the broad range of public affairs, administration, and policy professions and sectors. The idea here is that this is not purely a theoretical degree. This is not just about what you know but there also is an experiential component to it. That doesn't necessarily mean a program has an internship. You can have experiential exercises and activities in other forms, um, but we don't expect that students will graduate from a NASPA accredited program only having interacted with faculty. They need to interact with practitioners. They need to have some experience as part of a professional degree and not only they need to be provided with that, but they need to then also have competencies that are related to being a professional so that they are prepared for the expectations of this policy.
public affairs, public administration, and public policy profession. So what does all of that mean? How do, how do programs document that they have uh, met these four component parts of standard five? It really, we have to start with the basics related to competencies. What is a competency? Probably the easiest way to think about a competency in, is in terms of what additional information is added compared to what was required under previous versions of NASPA accreditation standards. If we think about old standards, they primarily asked about inputs. What classes do students have to take as part of your curriculum, for example? Here we're trying to go beyond that and we want to know what knowledge, skills, and abilities will students have after they complete this program. This is not specific to a course, but for the entire program or a specialization or a track within a program. What do you expect the students to know and be able to do upon completion of a specialization or of the entire degree? So we have these different categories of competencies, but they all share in common this notion of knowledge, skills, and abilities. They also all have to be linked to the mission of a particular program. How are competencies operationally defined? That's through learning objectives. What do you expect students to be able to demonstrate that they know and are able to do related to your mission? In each of these areas, it's up to a program to define what it will look like when a student has a competency as opposed to what it will look like when they don't have that competency. And then that gets to the third component which is how do they assess students on their competencies. This involves kind of tracking through the process by which they expect students to develop competencies. So programs have to articulate in what courses or through what experiences within the program do they expect students to be introduced to a competency. And hopefully that's in multiple places, not putting all of the burden for a particular competency on a single course. But where with, throughout the program are students introduced to competencies? Where are they provided opportunities to practice those competencies? Presumably these are skills that actually take some practice. They're not just introduced to a student and instantly they have them. And then finally, where in the program and through what processes does the program assess whether a student actually has attained that competency? And there is no expectation that every student will excel at every competency that's expected, but instead that programs will be constantly assessing their own performance, not an individual student's performance, that we take care of through grading processes, but that the program is assessing programmatic level performance to see if enough students are performing well enough on these learning objectives and demonstrating these competencies as measured through portfolios, comprehensive exams, capstone reports, case studies, any number of different methods to assess student competencies and that the program then takes that information and actually uses it to make programmatic improvement. So that whole assessment process, this notion of defining a competency, operationally defining it, um, and assessing students is part of a cycle of assessment that can be broken into four basic steps. So the first thing is to operationally define a competency in relation to the program's mission. This means being more specific, in the example of standard 5.1, for example, taking one of those domain areas, or each of those domain areas, and being more specific about what do you expect a student to know or be able to do in relation to your mission in the context of that universal domain. Then deciding what evidence of learning, of skill, of ability is going to be collected on each competency. This could be through um, portfolios, 
information that's gathered, material that students compile and submit. It could be through um, the use of rubrics to evaluate the quality of a capstone presentation or a capstone report. Any number of different methods can be used um, to gather evidence of learning on each competency. The third step is also critical, though, that the programs actually do more than just collect evidence. They analyze it. They review it. They look for patterns and trends and look to see how well are they doing, where are they doing well, where could they stand to improve. And then finally, to complete the cycle, they actually have to have evidence that they use the results of their analysis to consider and presumably make at least some programmatic changes or to make decisions to continue existing programmatic policies and practices. So this is all part of a program evaluation process. It's the same kind of process that our programs try to prepare our students to do as they go out into the work world. Now we need to do this within the context of our own program. So what is it that COPRA actually requires a program to demonstrate as part of this process? In a self-study report, programs have to provide information on a complete assessment cycle. That's all four of those steps from defining the competency and operational terms, selecting the evidence used to measure that competency, analyzing that evidence, and using the results of that analysis to inform programmatic changes. They need to provide evidence of that complete assessment cycle for one universal competency, that means in one of the five domains, and if they have any mission-specific competencies, then they need to do so for one of those mission-specific competencies. And if they have any specializations or concentrations or tracks, then they need to provide information and documentation about a complete assessment cycle for one of the competencies within a specialization or track. COPRA doesn't expect at this time that they, a program will describe the entire assessment cycle for every competency in an individual self-study. Um, but they need to describe where they are at in for all of the other competencies. Probably the best way to, to envision what that looks like is to see how they actually will report that information to COPRA in the self-study report. So, the next slide shows the way in which the programs will report on the online self-study for each of the competency areas within Standard 5. It's a checkbox system. And you can see they're just reporting how far along are they in the process. In this case, to lead and manage in public governance, the program has indicated that they have gone so far as to define learning outcomes, to gather evidence, and to analyze evidence. But they have not gone so far as to use that evidence in programmatic decisions. Similarly, they've checked the same level of progress with participating in and contributing to the public policy process. And this goes all the way through the various um, categories of competencies that are covered by standards 5.1, 5.2, 5.3. Now, it's important to note that the program then will provide more detailed information about one of the five competency domains, the universal required domain, and one of their mission-specific required competencies, if applicable, and one of the mission-specific elective competencies, if applicable but not on all of the others. And it's the site visit team's responsibility to confirm, or in some cases, update, how far along the program is on each of the other competency areas. So just because the self-study report only asks for a sample of the competency areas doesn't mean that the program is off the hook on all of the other areas. 
this is where the site visit team really has a tremendous responsibility. And the programs know that they need to provide the site visit team with additional information. So programs need to show to the site visit team information about all of the competency areas covered by 5.1, 5.2, and 5.3. And you as a site visit team member have a responsibility, the site visit team as a whole has a responsibility to discuss all of the competencies. So even though the program will have only reported about one of the five universally required domains, you need to talk about the other four. See, have they defined mission-driven mission um, competencies related to those other four domain areas? Have they determined what kind of evidence they will use? And have they gathered that evidence? Have they analyzed that evidence? Have they used that evidence to make decisions? They don't have to show that they're all the way through the cycle on all of those, at least not at this stage. But you need to be able to document and report to COPRA where are they in each of those areas. If they have mission-specific competencies, and again, not all programs will, you need to document where they are in those. If they have any electives or specializations, you need to be talking to them about the competencies in conjunction with each elective, each specialization. So a program that claims to offer eight specializations or concentration areas, you're going to need to have conversations with the program representatives about competencies in each of those eight specialization areas. The programs will need to show you their evidence on how far along they are in the assessment cycle for each of those competency areas and what plan they have for assessing each competency. They don't necessarily need to assess every competency every year. They could have a rotational cycle. But in a seven-year accreditation period, they should have a plan that ensures they will have reviewed every competency at least once during that accreditation period. And that this is not just something that's done on an ad hoc basis, but there's a systematic process um, for doing that. So what kinds of questions should you be asking as a member of a site visit team as it relates to standard five? Um, Sorry, let me back up just a little bit and talk about some additional information that the programs might um, provide. What do programs need to show the site visit team regarding assessment and how they're using the results of assessment? The kinds of things they might provide might include rubrics that they use for grading assignments, um, if that's how they're assessing a competency, um, what kinds of forms or rubrics or systems they're using to evaluate portfolios, for example, they need to be able to show you the evidence that they are collecting. And then in terms of demonstrating that they use that information to make programmatic improvements, they might have meetings, uh, minutes from faculty meetings or retreats that document conversations that took place as they discussed whether or not this was an adequate level of performance on competencies or whether they should be making some changes. There might be email correspondence. There might be new policies that were enacted and they have evidence of that and they can show you, track the changes in their student handbook or in their curriculum and document the rationale for that. And the idea here is that they'll be able to show to you that the changes that they've made to the program, improvements that they made to the program, were based on a systematic assessment process of student learning objectives, of competencies, that they gathered this information through a, a planned process, they analyzed it systematically, and then they used that to inform their programmatic improvement. Not just that they decided to make some improvement because somebody had a great idea, but that it actually is linked to the assessment process. So now in terms of the kinds of questions um, that you should be asking as a site visit team. 
there are actually several different categories of questions that relate to standard five. First, how did they define their competencies in relation to their mission? Um, what was the process that they used? Who was involved? What were the ultimate outcomes? What, how, what are the definitions that they came up with for those competencies related to their mission? How did they choose their measures and assess achievement? What was their rationale for using portfolios rather than capstones or vice versa? Um, for using um, rubrics and, and how did they come up with those rubrics? Again, what was the process they went through to choose those measurements? What were the outcomes? And who was involved in that process? How did they figure out what was the acceptable level of performance? Did they decide that 90% of students need to show exceptional level of competence or that 80% of students need to show a moderate level of competence? The key is not what was their decision, but how did they go about making that decision? And is it related to the program mission? So if a program has identified that they want to be a leader in a particular um, area and they're preparing people for high-level positions in the federal service, we might expect that they have higher standards than a program that says they are preparing people for entry-level positions where perhaps they, they set their, they define their competencies in different ways or perhaps they even determine the cutoff points, the threshold levels of acceptable results in different ways. And again, as a site visitor, your job is not to determine if they made the right decisions or the wrong decisions or if they should have different um, thresholds or different measures, but simply to document what are they doing and what was their reasoning and what process did they use so that you can provide a more complete description to COPRA. Remember that your task is to confirm whether the written information they provided is accurate and complete and also what additional information can you provide because perhaps the self-study report didn't ask for that but you're being asked for it as a member of the site visit team. Another component of the questions that you should be asking as a member of a site visit team is how often do they assess student achievement of the competencies? Is it on an annual basis? Is it every semester? Are some competencies assessed every year and others only assessed every three years? Again, documenting the factual information for COPRA's use. Very important in this process is who was involved in each stage along the way. What stakeholders participated in this process? Was it just the MPA or MPP director who was making decisions or conducting the analysis or interpreting the results? Was it a group of faculty? Was it all faculty? Were there students or alumni or employers involved? Is there an advisory board that was involved? Who were the various actors involved in this process? And what was the rationale for their level of involvement? And then finally, how are they using the results of assessment to make programmatic decisions? Can they document the nature of the deliberations, how they interpreted the results of the assessment, and why they chose to make particular uh, decisions? The idea behind this program evaluation or assessment of competencies kinds of process is that programs should be engaged in continuous improvement. We don't expect that any program at any point in time is doing everything perfectly. It's okay that they're making changes on a regular basis as long as those changes are being informed by this assessment process. So there is a little bit of a different approach with respect to standard 5.4, which has to do with the professional competencies. And the best way to um, appreciate what's required here and what kinds of questions you might ask um, is by looking at 
how the information is reported by the programs in their self-study report. Excuse me. They are asked to complete a table that says for these many different types of experiential activities or the kinds of activities that would allow students to interact with practitioners, to what extent are they part of the program? And they have several different options. Is it required of all students? Do students have frequent opportunities to engage in these kinds of activities? Do students have uh, seldom have opportunities to engage in these kinds of interactive activities with practitioners? Or is this not usually available to students within the program? And within the self-study report, there are a number of different um, common approaches to providing these professional competencies. And then programs are also allowed to identify others. In this case, probably the most important thing for the site visit team to do would be to confirm that the information reported by the program in their self-study report matches with what students have been experiencing in the program. So at the, at the most obvious level, if a program says that um, guest lectures are required of all students. That is, all students will be required to take classes that have guest lectures or that they will be required to attend some sessions that have practitioners as guest lectures. If a program says that's required, you should be able to talk to students. I'm mean, presuming they're not in their first semester, but they're far along in the program, and they should say, yes, we all have experienced that. Um, if, they, if a program reports that they have um, uh, requiring attending uh, formal meetings is something that's frequently required or there are frequent opportunities for that. Again, the feedback from students as you probe and ask questions should match with what the program has reported. And if there are inconsistencies there, that should be reported uh, to COPRA. And those inconsistencies are not always something negative for the program. Sometimes students may report that they've had much more experience and opportunity to do things than what the program um, perceives is available to them. Whatever the case may be, the factual information that you learn as part of the site visit should be part of what you report to COBRA. Now, these standards are relatively new, having been adopted in, 2000, in the fall of 2009 and taking effect the, in the year after that. So there is a transition period in effect as it relates to this particular standard, standard 5.0, and the um, learning objectives and competencies. So at this point in time, with respect to the required, the universally required, the mission specific and the elective competencies, the guidelines from COPRA allow programs to demonstrate and document that they have completed an assessment cycle for one of the competencies in each of those areas. But they don't necessarily have to have completed an assessment cycle for all of the others. They simply have to document at what stage of the assessment cycle have they progressed. But it's likely that as these standards become um, uh, more longstanding and programs have more experience, the expectations of COPRA will evolve over time and probably the expectations will reach a point where programs will be required to document that they have completed an assessment cycle for all competencies. Um, we're not there yet, but we will be there at some point. That's kind of a, a brief overview of the site visit team's responsibilities with respect to Standard 5. There are some additional resources that you are encouraged to consult. Um, COPRA interpretations regarding um, guidance and past precedent, and these are updated on a regular basis. There's an